with us here in Studio 10 is Ray Powell. Okay, he is a um, of Project Sea Light, a maritime transparency mm. project at the Stanford University. For those who, of us who follow his uh, handle on X, the former Twitter, uh, it's uh, Gordon Not Ray. He is the one responsible for for posting those images. I think those satellite images um, of the Chinese vessels massing in yeah. the West Philippine Sea. The last time uh, he, he you made a post was that what appeared to be the largest gathering of Chinese vessels in anticipation of the Atin Ito Regatta. Yeah, there was a large concentration of Chinese vessels at uh, Scarborough Shoal that I had never seen before, mm -hmm. and they were clearly concerned about the, um, the upcoming uh, uh, civilian convoy, uh, and they wanted to make sure that they successfully blockaded those boats away from Scarborough Shoal. Ray, uh, first question, I'm, I'm kind of curious, how do you get these images? So actually, they, so this particular image, the one you just saw on the screen, is a satellite, overhead satellite mm -hmm. photo, uh, which I get from commercial satellites okay. uh, that I have access to, sometimes through uh, Planet Labs, which has a contract with Stanford University, and sometimes through a provider called SkyFi, with which I have a very uh, good relationship, and, uh, and they are actually a, a low-cost way to get to satellite images. Okay. But the other images, for example, when we can see the ships moving around, we see through uh, tracking what we call their AIS broadcast, which is Automatic Information System. And all civilian ships, large civilian ships, yeah. are supposed to use this. Yeah. Uh, now, what we find for China's ships, of course, is sometimes they do and sometimes yeah. they don't. But when, we, when they don't, we call that going dark. So that allows us to see a lot of what's happening mm. in, the, in yeah. the West Philippine Sea. And what's the interest of Sea Light in, in trying to highlight these uh, activities in, of the Chinese Coast Guard and Chinese Navy? So Sea Light is a maritime transparency project. And so we just truly believe, we're very mission driven, we believe that when you eliminate the grayness of the gray zone, when you basically turn on the lights and show the world what is actually happening, that a lot of the things that happen in the gray zone, like harassment, like coercion, like illegal fishing, these things are exposed and then they can be dealt with. Yeah. And when you don't see that is when they thrive and they can do whatever they want. What do you say about uh, your detractors who say that uh, this uh, transparency project of yours, this uh, Miusho project, is a uh, Similar almost to a QAnon conspiracy, no? uh, <laughs> with uh, superpowers uh, yeah. mining it or uh, running it. Uh, I first heard about it late last year, but I think they've been talking about it uh, much longer. No? Yeah, uh, so I, 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 my first impression is what's wrong with transparency? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah. I would, so first of all, I get lots of different accusations. Yeah, yeah. Some is that I work for naval intelligence. Yeah. And the funny thing is I was in the Air Force. I yeah. actually don't have a connection to the Navy. Yeah. Although they have correctly noted that the Gordian Knot Center, mm -hmm. which is the, the center that, that hosts Sea Light or with, that, that Sea Light falls under, has in the past received uh, some money from the Office of Naval Research. Uh, unfortunately, Sea Light does not get any of that particular money. Mm. Uh, I, not that I would, I, I would be happy to get money. <laughs> if, if anyone has money, I'm, I'm happy to take it. But you no, know, we are actually an all volunteer yeah. organization. And that's very hard to disprove, right? I mean, it's very hard to disprove. If somebody accuses you of getting money that you don't have, how do you prove that you didn't get money, right? Yeah. But uh, it's, I mean, almost everybody who works for Sea Light is a volunteer. Actually, everybody who works. I will say this the only people who receive any money what, whatsoever is there are, is a very small number of students at Stanford University who are getting very small stipends so that they can cover their costs if they do yes. research with the with the Gordian Knot Center. But but as a concept, no, what's wrong with transparency? <laughs> I, yeah. I'm, I'm big on yeah, transparency. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. that's my favorite thing. Yeah. So um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's you know generally the bad things tend to happen in dark places. Mm -hmm. And so I am a fierce advocate of transparency. I'd like to see transparency in government. I'd like to see transparency in the maritime gray zone, which is what I cover. So yes. I understand that uh, Sea Lake was brought about. Yes, yes, You're I mean. talking about maritime gray zones, and other countries have expressed concern about this. Not just the US, there's Japan, Australia. Are you seeing similar gray zone operations in other parts of the world? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, Ami, I, we see them in the East China Sea, for example. 
You also see yeah. that there are huge parts of, so I, we recently were talking on our podcast uh, that I do with, back in the States with uh, Ian Urbina, who runs something called the Outlaw Ocean Project. And what he, yeah. he has gone all over the world doing uh, reports on illegal <laughs> fishing, human rights violations. The thing about the maritime gray zone is it is a perfect place for bad things to happen because nobody is watching you, right? You're often in international waters, you're often in ungoverned space. Uh, so it is a problem globally. The South China Sea problem, the West Philippine Sea problem, is a very specific problem because it involves this large state actor, China, which is using its, its, its gray zone tactics to push other countries out of it, they, it's claimed it's very large maritime claims. For so how, how point, white countries deal with this? What are the responses that have been proposed? Well, so every country tends to deal with it in a little bit of a different way. And actually, mm -hmm. one of the things that I have observed is that the Philippines last, say, year and a half of assertive transparency, which is my word for it, uh, has been a game changer. It has been it has brought something very new and something that the world really needs to pay attention to and figure out, can this be replicated in other parts of the, the, the gray zone and not just in the maritime space, in the cyberspace, in space, in uh, the financial space. Yeah. It, you know, there are lots of different places where you could apply the same idea because when you actually show the public what is happening, the Philippines has, I think, actually gained se several very valuable things one is a great deal of national resiliency. You guys just finished this discussion about the Pogos and, uh, and uh, Mayor Gu. And you know, why is it that everybody is suddenly looking into this? Because the, the nation is becoming more resilient against these things. That is often, that, that, that I, could say, I would propose to you that this, this, this uh, transparency has yielded that kind of, uh, of national resilience. You also have seen a, an uptick in international support. President Marcos was the keynote speaker at Shangri-La yeah. that just finished in Singapore. International stage, he was the keynote speaker. Why? Because the Philippines is at the center of attention. The Philippines has changed the game. And, you know, so they didn't go and pick, a, uh, they didn't go and pick some, you know, defense minister from a big power. They didn't go and find the prime minister of, of Japan again. They went to the Philippines because the Philippines is the one who has made a difference. Yeah. From your vantage point, what do you think about that keynote spe speech of the president? Because uh, his detractors are saying here this past few days that uh, he went overboard in uh, saying that uh, he's uh, crossing the Rubicon speech. That we are that we are going to it's close to war if a single Filipino is killed uh, in this uh, Chinese aggression, even if that Filipino is a civilian. Uh, so, what do you think? Because uh, uh, this has been an issue these past few days. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I honestly, I think that he just stated what is a reality, which is, and I think that you know, China needs to know that the Philippines takes this seriously, that you can't just go around water cannoning everyone in sight because somebody's going to get hurt. Those are, they are considered to be non-lethal weapons, but that doesn't mean they can't kill somebody, yeah. right? So he's, he's just trying to send a message. Now, he didn't say he was going to war. Mm -hmm. that, you know, the question, he was answering a question, a question about red lines, about whether or not this would be considered an act of war. And he said, look, we're getting close to that, right? And that's a, that's a real concern, right? What happens then to the discussion? What hap Does it mean that everybody's going to go to war? Of course not, right? But what it means is we take this into a whole new space. I could easily see this creating quite a diplomatic crisis. Yeah. Well, do, do you see China sort of stepping up its activities or its aggression? 100%, absolutely. I mean, the, the I level... Mean, where, 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 are, where are they coming from and where are they now? So, you know, if I, if I were to put this back a year and a half, they would have had just a couple of ships around Scarborough Shoal, a couple around uh, Ayungan Shoal. You know, they would have, you know, maybe a few up back at Mischief Reef. Now there are, at any given time, you know, at least a dozen around Scarborough Shoal. They are now have pushed past uh, Ayungan Shoal and now are at Sabina Shoal okay. on a full-time basis. Right, there is always a ship there. Now, what the Philippines has done is send out the its Coast Guard. Ship. Yes, the, 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 one of the one of the ninety-seven meter ships, the BRP Toyosa Magbanwa. 
because the Philippines wants to say, we are not just going to let you take this without us <laughs> contesting it. And you can see China is very annoyed by it, right? They, they would like the Philippines not to be there. But the Teresa McManwa has not moved in over a month and a half. Yeah. So the Philippines is finally you know, able to go out and say, no, we are going to contest you here. You, 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 you just seem to, um, China seems to be very interested in Sabina. Yes. Um, yeah. So there has been a presence there actually annually for quite a while, usually a small number of what we call rafted vessels. So these are okay. the Spratly backbone fishing vessels that tie themselves together and sit there and do nothing. And why do they do nothing? One is, for, from China's perspective, they establish their presence. From the fishing vessels, what what's happening is they're getting a, what, a fuel subsidy mm -hmm. to go to the Spratleys and to sit. They don't have to do anything, and if they don't do anything, they're not using any fuel and they get to keep the money. Right? So their job is to go there and, and, and stay together. And so that's what they have done, and they are still doing that. But now you're seeing active Chinese Coast Guard, active maritime militia uh, moving around the shoal. And of course, we've also seen this, apparently, they're beginning to dump coral and build up sort of a, an above water feature there. Is, is this a simple case of a racket, Chinese uh, sailors and Navy men trying to earn an extra buck? Or is there a strategic... Um, consequence or implication in their presence there, in their continued presence Well, okay, so it's... I mean, it, what's happening? We, 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 you mentioned a while ago, yep. they're dumping corals. Yeah. They're, um, to the uninitiated, they would presume it's island building activity or, or something like that. What is happening? So I think, so, okay, from the sailor's perspective, these are, these are, you know, the ones that tie themselves together are fishing boats that don't fish. Mm -hmm. They're instead getting money for the government for fuel subsidies and not using it so that they can keep the money. That, but they are doing that because the Chinese state wants them to do that. Because what they're doing is over time, you say, okay, we have these vessels there. And over time, we can say we've always been there. And everybody knows it's ours because we've always been there. It's occupation. Exactly. And then over time, they can So now they, they, they dump coal, right? And then they take something that used to be below water, and now it's above water. And they can say, look, this is territory. Yes. And we claim this territory because this is Chinese territory. Yes. You know we've always been there because our boats are all tied together there. So, you know, under international law, there, it, something that's above water yes. qual qualifies as being territory. So it, and it, it generates um, a, a, territorial, a, a territorial water. Territorial sea. Now, the, uh, probably, uh, almost certainly under the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, they would not, be re they would not recognize this as being legitimate territory. They would say, no, this, you put this here. This is artificial, <laughs> right? And that's what they've done with a lot of China's artificial islands is they've said, you don't get a territorial sea if you dump concrete there and make a runway because under international law, that's still a reef yes. because that's what it was before you showed up. So I think this idea of dumping the coral and sort of walking away, and not, then they can't say, you did this, because, well, who says we did this? Did it you, you spontaneously have grew from exactly. the sea, no? <laughs> exactly. Uh, like everything, no? Yes. But uh, on a different topic, uh, you saw earlier the dangerous maneuvers between yes. our supply, small supply boats and the Chinese Coast Guard. Yes. Uh, in situations like this, accidents can happen. Of course. Uh, my question is, what is the process of invoking the Mutual Defense Treaty from the side of the Americans? Yeah. How, how does it go? Uh, Congress, executive, etc. So we've been talking about that yep. in a basically theoretical manner. But in concrete terms, how does it unfold? The, so the complicated answer to your simple question <laughs> is it depends. Yeah. Um, so. so the Mutual Defense Treaty is not like a light switch. You know, it's not on or off. Actually, it's more like a dimmer switch, right? It's like, how high up do you turn it? So in some ways, we've already kind of turned it up a little bit because for the last year and a half especially, we have been repeatedly talking about the mutual defense. Every time something happens, the U.S. official will come out and say, this is the U.S. commitment under the mutual defense treaty, you know, over and over. So it's being invoked already. But ironclad. It, what's that? Ironclad. <laughs> I, we love the word ironclad in the United States. It is a great word. Um, but, you know, so it's, in some ways it's already being invoked, right? But the question is, what does it mean if, for example, let's say a Philippine sailor gets killed. Mm. And then, there, then what it would chase us to is consultations, right? Because, you know, probably President Marcos would call President Biden and say, this has happened, what do we... And so the next st stage is consultations. Nobody just sort of then says, okay, the light switch is on and now we're at war. Yeah. That's, not, that's not the way these things work. And thank goodness, right? I mean, you don't want to have that going on, <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, so it's, it, it depends. Hmm.
Mm. Mr. Powell, going back to the responses, the, there are proposals to borrow a page from the China Coast Guard and to develop a Coast Guard of our own with with the power to engage well, maybe not in combat, but to to put arms in our Coast Guard ships, maybe, you know, powerful water cannons as well. What do you think of that idea? So I am actually, so what China is doing to the Philippines is, is attacking yes. asymmetrically, right? So what, what that yes. means is yes. it has, for example, more and larger ships than the Philippines does. And that's mm -hmm. not going to change anytime soon. Right. So even if the Philippines increases its maritime capacity with, for example, these new ships from Japan, absolutely, that's a good thing. And it should definitely do that. Mm. Right. But yep. that doesn't mean that that all of a sudden the Philippines should then go out and go toe to toe symmetrically with the Chinese because they still have the the advantage if you go sort of directly at them. So I think it's yeah. wise for the Philippines to do things asymmetrically. Also, where does the Philippines have strength? The Philippines have strength for its, first of all in its in its uh, legal standing on the international stage in its moral mm. authority as being the clearly aggrieved party recognized by almost everybody who's not in Beijing. Uh, it has a, a a network now a growing network of partners and allies. Now it has Japan that is coming in and beginning to work on this reciprocal access agreement. You have the quadrilateral uh, things going on with Australia and the U.S. and Japan. So the, the Philippines, I think, is wisely trying to figure out where do we have asymmetric advantages where we can put pressure back on China. And I think that by being transparent, by opening this up to the world, by growing the network, now again you've got the, the trilateral summit in Washington, D.C. You've got, you've got President Marcos appearing on the international stage. The Philippines is learning how to fight back asymmetrically. Okay. The global uh, talking, about, China. talking about asymmetrical yeah. uh, uh, strategy. What do you think about this uh, ragtag civilian missions uh, in the West Philippine Sea, like uh, the Christmas mission last December, mm -hmm. and uh, this Bajo de Basin Law? Because this doesn't, yeah. this doesn't fall within the mutual defense treaty framework. No, uh, it's very clear that in the fine details of the of the treaty, there's nothing about uh, invoking it based on uh, attacks on civilians. Well, this is th this is the Philippines civil society rising up and fighting back, right? And that's, that's another one of the Philippines' asymmetric advantages is that you are a democracy. You have civil society groups who have their own way to, to rise up. Uh, you know, I, I know that I, there were things that came out that suggested that I was somehow behind this, yeah. this, this billion call. I have, honestly, I've never <laughs> met any of these people. You, you, you've only uh, met Toronto for the first well, time. Well, I have no idea. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, but it is a sign of the national resilience that is growing in the Philippines as a result of the transparency campaign. You know, I, I just want to keep giving credit to the Philippine government for turning on the lights, for turning on the cameras, because this is the kind of thing, you know, a, a country can't fight back against this kind of aggression, especially a democratic country, unless you have the people of the country behind you. And this, is, this, the, this civilian convoy is a symptom of that kind of support. Do, do you think it, it's working, given that China's response was to, in some Scale way, up. escalate? Oh, yeah. It, China is by threatening arrest, to arrest, 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 arrest officers. officers. So, uh, <laughs> so I think this is still early in the game, mm. right? So the, the, the issue is the, the Philippines turns on the cameras. China is clearly unhappy. And now China has made the determination, we will try to escalate the Philippines out of its position. So they want to say, we can take this longer than you can. And so far, the Philippines said, Try me, right? The, 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 the Philippines would have to make a call or simply back down. So, what kind of escalation can the Philippines do? So, I mean, at this point, what kind of response? Right now, China has escalated, right? And it is uh, using up resources, physical resources like, you know, fuel and, and ships and those kinds of things that it takes to elevate its response at the features, but also its own international reputation. To what extent, I think one of the questions is, to what extent will, the, will China begin to start uh, uh, incurring a geopolitical cost, an economic cost for its activities, as people begin to start, you know, back away and realize this aggressive China is not a version that we want to have, you know, represented on the international stage in the, in the, the way that it has in the past. 
And at some point, what I think the Philippines w will hope for is that China will change course and say, okay. this, this is not working in China's national that's, interest. That's the, that's Mr. Wish. Mr. Powell, that's so the wish. What do you the, think of the Philippines turning it into an environmental issue? Because that's what some of our government officials are now considering on top of the arbitration, of course. Highly we are going case. to file an environmental complaint. I think you think it, it has any chances? I do. I think, first of all, I think it's, it's based in fact, right? I mean, and one of the, the weaknesses that the Philippines does face is it faces an access problem. So, for example, yeah. one of the places that we suspect tremendous environmental damage is at, is at Scarborough Shoal, right? Because China has controlled it since 2012 and, of course, is not going to allow in international bodies to go investigate. But we know that China's giant clam harvesting is an extremely destructive practice. We've seen this reported over and over again. Yes. This is where they go in, they go deep into the reefs, they, 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 they put, not, don't just pull the giant clams out, but they spew the residue all over the reef, which kills off great parts of the reef. So this is something we know happens. We know China has been doing this and con continues to do this to this day. And if, if the Philippines is able to, to uh, get enough evidence I think it has a, a great potential to make a difference and, in the international space. And these giant clams well, in are in older case than we uh, all we our win age the put case. together. Well, what might be the consequences <laughs> for China well, in case we win an environmental complaint? Uh, so, of course, you know, what we've seen in the past is that China ignores the rulings, right? They say this yes. does not apply to us. You, you know, it, uh, so I think that China will be tempted to do the same thing again. But what happened from mm. the, the 2016 arbitral <laughs> tribunal ruling? Certainly, China ignored it, but almost yes. the entire world recognizes that the Philippines was right. People talk about this everywhere in the world. <coughs> the Philippines was, it was clearly ruled in the Philippines' favor, and people everywhere else refer to this as being legally binding. So, you know, this, this is another example of asymmetric, you know, a response. So, relying on the Philippines' legal and moral authority. Uh, by being the aggrieved party, by, by, by representing the truth, I think is, a, is, a, is an advantage in favor of the Philippines. So you would consider uh, transparency, all these transparency initiatives, um, uh, including Atinito or the government, our Philippine government's yes. own measure transparency, I think that's their term. Um, do, you, do you see this as our own gray zone strategy? And is, I, it, is, it, is it having an impact on China in a positive way? Yeah. Well, okay, so I would call it a counter gray zone uh, uh, strategy, and I would go further as I say, I think this is one of the most innovative counter gray zone strategies the world has seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I am hoping that through more and more recognition of what the Philippines has done here, it will inspire other governments in other domains to use a similar strategy to expose this kind of state-based gray zone aggression, right? And so I, I think, I, 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 being an optimist, hope that in five years we're looking back at this moment and saying this is where the Philippines really educated the world and changed the game. The, you know, the question of you know, what is China doing in response? Right now, again, China is not listening. They are escalating. The, the question is at what point does China reach the point where it says this escalation is not working to our favor? Our national interests are not served by trying to push and push and push so aggressively on every front to where it's costing us everywhere else in the world. Yeah, because, you know, Ray, um, Chinese society, it's a closed society, remember, um, I don't think they're big on transparency. <laughs> no. So <laughs> no. maybe transparency is not the best way, <laughs> maybe, to convince the Chinese to, to step back or, or well, take it down right. a notch. So the question is, who are you trying to reach, right? And as right. you say, you know, they, their, their information environment does not allow the truth to get into China. They get to see what the Communist Party wants them to see. So that really, you're, you're, you're dealing with ultimately with an audience of one mm -hmm. in Xi Jinping, right? We know that he is the ultimate decider there. Okay. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to get him to the point where he says, China's national interests are not served best this way. We are paying too high a cost internationally. We have other things we want to do. Why are we spending so much time sort of running into the wall here in the West Philippine Sea when all we have to do is turn the temperature back down? 
So in some ways, it's easier because you, all you need to do is convince one person. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Or now, he's not the easiest person than... to reach. Or, or your main audience is your own population, mm -hmm. and then the allies, yeah. and then the world. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, so, talk, talking yeah. about the world allies, yeah. and um, for sure, the Western world is is on this. Uh, but I'm, I'm not so sure whether um, it is working. It is helping convince, let's say, transparency. This transparency initiative is helping convince our neighbors within sure. ASEAN. Yeah. Well, I think they you're right. They seem to have a different I, mind than this. I, I agree. And, and, you know, I mean, many of the ASEAN nations for many years have tried to lay low and you know, believe that they are sort of managing the, the China situation. So several things happened. One is I think that the Philippines situation just turned more urgent mm -hmm. because of a couple of things. One is geography. A lot of these features that we're talking about are in the Philippines EEZ, Exclusive Economic Zone. Vietnam and Malaysia and Indonesia and Brunei do not have a large Chinese military base like Mr. Reef in their Exclusive Economic Zones. That's something unique to the Philippines. They are not facing a blockade of one of their military outposts at Ayung and Shoal like the Philippines is. Nothing like that is happening to any of China's neighbors, uh, other neighbors. To they, Ronald's point, yeah. that's the point he's been making vis-a-vis uh, so, -vis other ASEAN countries. So right? if, if another ASEAN country you know, wags their finger and says, why can't the Philippines be smart like us? Mm -hmm. Say, <laughs> right. okay, wait till China blockades one of your military outposts and then come back and talk to me, right? Wait until they won't allow your fishermen to go to one of their major important fishing grounds that feeds an entire coastline and, and you know, provides food security for, for your nation and see if you're quite so sanguine about, oh, that, you know, you, we can manage them. So, yeah, the Philippines geographically does have a harder problem in those countries. Okay. But Mr. Powell, do you actually see ASEAN changing its stand on the issue? I see ASEAN it's been, it's been several Continuing decades where they already. Are. I, yeah. don't, I don't I, remember them ever supporting the Philippines. I think that, it, that, the, that the administration here is wise to look up elsewhere. Not that you don't mm -hmm. keep making the case to ASEAN. You have to do that. But I think expecting ASEAN to come through. So, for example, on the yes. code of conduct on the South China Sea, I think, I honestly believe that will never, ever, ever be a thing. Yeah. Yes. Because it is simply, the, 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 the interests are, are too divergent. Who, so why, why, why do we talk about a code of conduct? Because the declaration hmm. of conduct in, that was signed in 2002 has not been enforced. <laughs> it is unenforceable. And so they said, well, we, we need an, enforce, yeah. uh, an enforceable one. Well, who's going to enforce that? Will China allow anyone not named China to enforce it? Yes. Right. So how are you going to come to an enforceable code of conduct? Yes. So I think that ASEAN re will remain an important forum for many things, but not for this. Yes. But uh, ASEAN, so the, member, the member countries ASEAN of ASEAN centrality? also changed should, positions. Is it a good idea? Like uh, Malaysia during the time of uh, Mahathir was very critical of China. No, uh, mm. Unlike now during the time of Anwar Ibrahim, Singapore ships position. Sometimes more critical, sometimes less critical. Vietnam is now organizing a strategic partnership with the US. Yeah. That has never happened before. Thailand is similar to Singapore. Sometimes shifting here, sometimes shifting there. Mm -hmm. Indonesia also has moments vis-a-vis uh, -vis China where they even uh, uh, bomb Chinese vessels uh, in the middle of the sea, the poachers. Right, right, right. But uh, of course, Probowo is still a question mark. Sure. Yeah. So uh, even ASEAN, if, even if now yeah. they're more sympathetic yeah. uh, or more, uh, not really pro China, yeah. but more anti uh, engagement with China, at particular moments, the members of ASEAN also change yes. uh, foreign policy. Of course. And you know, I mean, to be honest, so do our countries, yeah. right? You know, yeah. uh, the foreign policy of Rodrigo Duterte was different it, from this one. Will it change one. in November? Um, I, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, so I, I was in government at the time of the first Trump administration. Yeah. And, uh, you know, th there were differences. Mm -hmm. But I will say there was also, also a lot of uh, important things that happened. Uh, to, you know, to be honest, the beginning of that administration was where, honestly, the U.S. finally sort of came out of its national delusion about whether China would be somebody we could woo into our 
uh, our system, right? We, we, for many, many years, we thought just a little more capitalism, several, just a little more, decades. <laughs> little more openness, then we'll finally come over. And finally, at the beginning of the, Trump, the first Trump administration, uh, or the only Trump administration so far, there was a new national security set of documents written that we said, we are, they are competing with us, we have to compete back. So, you know, I mean, you never know. I, am, I, I tend to be optimistic about those kinds of things. And I think that the recognition that we need to turn our attention to this part of the world is actually across the board very strong, whether it be in the Republican side or the Democratic side. Ami, I mean, I did hear you ask about ASEAN centrality, and I want to, to, to address yeah. it. I think that ASEAN centrality can be useful in a lot of areas. I don't think that ASEAN has demonstrated that it can it can be central in, in a security sense. There's just not the will or the interest or the, or the infrastructure there to make that happen. So I think that ASEAN has its limits, as every organization well, to, to does. Well, to begin with, I think it's an really founded as an economic organization. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, right. <laughs> I, I think that there are people who would like ASEAN to be very central, and I think that, that there's, that's very attractive in many ways. It's just, you know, there are certain things that it's not, just not well equipped to deal with, and I think security is one. Yes. Ami, Ronald well, Ray, our, thank our you. Our president yeah. mentioned it <laughs> okay. in his speech yeah. about yeah. ASEAN centrality when he <laughs> talked in, in Singapore. Yeah. Ray, thank you for joining the Story Conference today. Patrick, it has been a pleasure. So.